Hi there. I'd like you all to come and join me on my personal pilgrimage into the film 2001 A Space Odyssey and the master of the movie, Arthur C. Clarke, who now lives in Sri Lanka or formerly Ceylon. And also we're going to go and check out the monolithic block, the big block that appears in 2001, which symbolizes a mysterious intelligence which man struggles to comprehend, even to this day. Cigars are from Ceylon. Beautiful things. I bought them when I was over there visiting Arthur. So come and join me. Shh. Here we are in 2001. Absolutely fantastic. There's the monolith. And I reckon we'll find something like this on Mars one day when man lands there. It's, shh. Fantastic. Hi Dave, how's your mission to Jupiter going? Good evening. Three weeks ago, the American spacecraft Discovery One... Hey, the food on Discovery One is absolutely terrible, you know. So I brought my own sandwich along. Dave, how's your, how's your food there, mate? Is it a bit hot? Mmm, <laughs> mmm. That was fun, wasn't it? Now come with me to, to Sri Lanka, and we'll go and visit Arthur C. Clarke, and talk to the man, the master of the movie, 2001. Going to the Gallface Hotel. Tell me, my good taxi man, what age is the hotel? Gallface Hotel, taxi yeah. driver. My name is Nihal. Hi, Nihal. Yeah. And what age is the hotel? Uh, 146 years old. 146 years old? Wow. It started in the 1864. Uh, so this is where Sir Arthur spent many, many months writing his last book, 3001. The Gold Face Hotel, right on the coastline of Sri Lanka. Old colonial. He, he's um, Casey Cooten. He's an old fellow. He's been there for years. He, I think he was there about 1940 or so. There's a plaque in the main foyer talking about the book that Sir Arthur wrote at this hotel. 3001 is the final odyssey. It came out after 2001 and then there was 2010. Then then there was um, 3001. Fantastic books on science fiction, space flight and everything else. Here's the coastline. It's, it's winter and it's really rough and wild, you know. Amazing. At night time there's boats all along the horizon waiting to get into the port. Amazing place to have a meal at night. Very romantic. Beautiful. And we go for a pan here. There's crows everywhere. Funny that. These dead damn crows come down and take your food off your plate at night. That's the room where Sir Arthur uh, did his book, the 3001, just inside there. Beautiful. Wild and wild. Arthur C. Clarke's office. And he's just checking his schedule, his books. And you're saying before, Arthur, there's life on Mars, you think? <laughs> Possibly. I think, uh, I'm 90% sure there's a lot of vegetation. I oh, yeah, won't hold you to it, don't worry. I will show you some of the images presently, you can then film them. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I believe, Arthur, they'll probably find the monolithic block, which, which you mentioned in your movie, on 2001, on Mars. How about that? Uh, do you, do well, you think so? Yes, if we find, we find it anywhere. Find it anywhere. They found one in uh, in Seattle recently. You know about that story, I suppose. No, I don't. No. Well, a beautiful one turned up in the middle of a park in Seattle overnight. A monolithic block. A beauty, uh, weighed tons. Was that? And, uh, ah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody who owned up to it, but it was quite a sensation. All, all the newspapers and TV. Was it a practical joke for um, somebody else? Yeah, right? yeah, just something. Uh, <laughs> Joseph. Yes, thank you. Get, Five of these, please. Um, my, my latest last words on UFOs, I think it's probably about 10 years since I wrote anything on the subject because it bores me stiff now. It's, yeah. it's, it's closed as far as I'm concerned. And I sort of tell people, if you've seen as many UFOs as I have, you won't believe in them. The sky is so full of things, you know. And, uh, yeah, they are. Yeah. It's incredible what people see and jump to mm. conclusions. 
I, uh, strange enough, the most remarkable one was with Stanley Kubrick, the very night we decided to make 2001. Yeah. And you'll find what that was, that it was the Echo Satellite. Fancy. In, in, uh, under very unusual conditions when we thought it wasn't, couldn't do that. Well, oh, Mars. Well, yeah. Trees or something. There's about a hundred of these. Oh, wait, wait, stop. Now, ah, here we are, next, a good, good. Uh, you know, there, some of them are better than others, but, but some of them, some of them are, look at, look at, that's, isn't that weird? It is really weird, and, yeah. Uh, and, and some, look at that. So, wouldn't you say it's a jungle trail? <laughs> yeah, it would, wouldn't you? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, that's very it. And which, which machine took these photos? The, which? Mars, the, Mar the Mars Observer. Mars <laughs> Observer, yeah. <laughs> Good it's, heavens. It's putting, uh, no, oh, back. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. I have to go back. Wait, Possible wait, life back. on Mars. Wait, wait, wait. Now, look at that, look at that, you see. Can you close in on that? Doesn't it look like vegetation? Yeah, it does, doesn't oh, it? spiders, look at them. Incredible. Yeah, amazing. I've yeah, never I seen it before. I have no idea what the hell that is. But, uh, I mean, it, Arthur, of all the various tasks which um, satellite in connection has facilitated, of all the benefits that have flowed from the satellite as a tool, which one function do you believe has had the greatest impact on the development of civilization as we know it today? It has been transparency. But it's one world now. Television reporters can get everywhere, whether they're wanted or not, and of course often they're not wanted. So it's no longer possible for governments to conceal for very long their crimes. That's your dog. That is my little dog, Minnie. I don't know quite what she's upset about. Minnie, shut up. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Um, it's no longer possible for governments to conceal their crimes from their outside world and from their own people. In your original Wireless World paper in 1945 and subsequent interviews, you have remarked that only one or two channels of TV would be sufficient for man's needs. Now there's hundreds of channels. Your thoughts on this, please. Thanks. Occasionally been asked how many channels of TV I think are necessary. I think I said two at one time. I love that. Now I think ten channels of TV are all that is necessary. <laughs> of course, I'm joking because there would be all sorts of specialized channels and of course business channels and the internet and so we really do need hundreds of channels carrying all sorts of information. Uh, satellites are making possible for the first time in history the global family of man and uh, also of course the internet, the two together this kind of synergistic reaction the two together are making one world with no boundaries anymore of geography, race, that the only limitation is the time factor. It's really inconvenient, of course, if you, but even then, of course, you can record your messages and uh, answer them later in the day. Uh, how the internet has taken over the world in an extraordinarily short period of time. I think the internet has been one of the most revolutionary inventions in the whole of human history. As revolutionary as the invention of the printing press. In fact, um, that's a revolution. It may undo books, may be on the way out. <laughs> We're now at Sigaria, Arthur, as you suggested. Amazing place. Paintings behind me are about 500 BC. We have second stage engine ignition, have burning engine cut off, block the end separation. We have separation of the middle adapter. We have main engine ignition. The demo set has had a good separation from the block DM. SL. One thing I never imagined was the coming of fiber optics. I thought that all long distance wideband communication would have to be by satellite. And along came these thin hairs of glass and really revolutionized the situation. And of course, satellites and fiber beautifully complementary. So your writing career in the early 1940s until the present time you have been directly or indirectly at the tiller of virtually every significant new conceptual process in the fields of rocket travel, space exp exploration and telecommunications. 100 years from now, today, in the year 2101, how would you expect to be best remembered? Thanks.
uh, I've been asked what I would most like to be remembered by in a hundred years time and the, the answer is my fiction and the movie 2001 because if I hadn't written that paper on the communication satellite in 1945 about 10 people would have done it within a year uh, people like John Pierce and Harold Rosen I mean it was only a matter of time I was just RTM, SL upper state. Love it. <laughs> Excellent. This is where Arthur sat reading and writing his last chapters of 3001 and now I'm reading carbon based bipeds. At launch Aurora's core stage engine and four liquid propellant strap-on boosters are ignited to boost the vehicle away from the launch pad. Two minutes into the flight the four strap-on boosters are jettisoned